Welcome back to another episode of Podward State. I'm your host, Sam Brungo, joined by guest host, Grace Cunningham. Grace, how's it going? Pretty good. Happy to be back. You had a pretty interesting week, didn't you? Yes, I, I rode the Nutmobile around campus. It was good. Um, I got to use the microphone. I got to yell at people around campus. I was shouting um, nut puns at them and compliments. I was telling people I like their shoes and whatnot. Very fun. Fun reactions from people. If you don't know what the hell she's talking about, you can go <laughs> listen to a, a couple episodes ago where she explains the Nutmobile. Um, yeah, today, cool episode two, uh, pre-State Patty's Day. We have anthropology of alcohol professor Dr. Kirk French joining us to talk a little bit about his life, which is very cool. He's traveled all over and he's has this class centered around the anthropology of alcohol that's become very popular at Penn State. So he talks a little bit about his take of stay patty's day and this and that without further ado let's get into it joining us now we have anthropology professor here at penn state kirk french kirk how's it going hey it's going pretty good it's going pretty good you know as far as uh being pretty much homebound for a year for the most part but uh but other than that i'm i'm healthy and happy and sitting in my own personal bar so i'm all right so for the listeners that don't know who you are because i would say around campus you are pretty well known would you agree you're one of the professors that the majority of people know because you teach a thousand person class yeah I guess that because of the number of students I teach yeah probably probably so for the listeners here that don't know who you are can you just tell us a little bit about yourself about your journey and how you ended up here at Penn State so yeah I grew up in southeast Texas and uh, I was a first generation student so neither one neither no one from either side of my family had gone to college um they told me to go off to college to, uh, you know, make money. That was the reason. It had nothing to do really with getting an education or becoming a better citizen or nothing like that. It was like, that's what you do. You know, you go and you make, you get a degree so you can make money. And that's what I did. I was a business major. And then I took an anthropology class, kind of stumbled into it. And uh, it blew my mind. And um, just, you know, a very different worldview than how I'd been brought up. My dad's a deacon in the Southern Baptist Church. You can imagine it's a very different world. And um, I, uh, I just kind of fell in love with it about how it kind of showed how, um, you know, how, how similar we all are, not, not necessarily focusing on the differences. And I, I think, and, and Sam, since you're in the class, you've probably heard me say this before, but it's, you know, I think that if you can realize how similar we are, that, that you can start focusing on that, then it helps us to appreciate the differences. And I started seeing that early on, and I really liked it. And so I just kept following it, you know, going into it. And so I got my uh, master's at University of Cincinnati, and then I moved up here to Penn State for my PhD. I graduated in 2009 uh, with my PhD, right when the economy fell apart the last time. And um, you know, there weren't really any jobs. And I was lucky that somebody had just left at Penn State and they let me take over this one class. And it was like an intro to art class, intro to archaeology class. And that was it. You know, it just kind of slowly turned into something more and more and more. I, when I moved up here for grad school in 2003, I, I mean, I was going to be here four or five years and be gone. You know, I mean, I moved here from Austin, you know, tons of live music and hip and cool. It was so awesome. And I was like, what? where am I, you know, but here I am, you know, and it's fine. I I like it. Um, So that's kind of what happened. You know, that's kind of how I got into it and got, you know, moved up here to central Pennsylvania. Kind of already touched on what led you to anthropology, but what led you to choose alcohol as the focus? That again happened kind of slowly um, in the sense that, you know, most of my research as an archaeologist has been about uh, human impact on the environment. And I've mainly worked in Mesoamerica with the ancient Maya um, and I mean, really, I'd say, you know, 80 to 90% of my research from the time I was a grad student up until a few years ago, really focused on that area, um, with like how the Maya dealt with water and how they dealt with climate change and how that, you know, Maya drought and all that kind of stuff. Right. So I spent about 60 or 70 months total in the field, not at one time, but over, you know, over like a 10 year period. So I've spent like five years in the field and while there. I definitely, um, you know, it's a work hard, play hard attitude being in the field. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, a lot of drinking in the evenings and talking about things and, and we're all anthropologists. So I think we were approaching it differently. Like, 
trying to find the weirder stuff, you know, the stuff, not like, not just the tequilas and the mezcals and the, and the Coronas and the Tecates and stuff, but like branching out. And we had a guy that worked on our project and he was Mayan and um, he was from this Highland village and he knew of this type of alcohol called posh. And he brought us, um, and it was just the, I had never thought about it that way before. Like that each culture probably has their own unique alcohol you know i mean like I, it had never you know there's vodka and there's tequila and like you know you just didn't i don't know i didn't think about these little niche things these things that you couldn't buy in a store and you know i slowly started working some of that into my intro to archaeology class and i realized that the students really liked that lecture better than a lot of the other ones because i was talking about booze and um it just got me into thinking more about like, well, maybe I, I mean, I love, that's the other thing I'm, I'm leaving out here. I really do like alcohol. Like I, I like to consume it. I like to hang out with friends and drink. I mean, like I, you know, it's just like probably both of you, right? I mean, I, I enjoy it. Right. So, and I realized like, well, man, maybe I could do re like, maybe I could do some research like around alcohol. So I put together this moonshine archeology span project in North Carolina and that kind of got the ball rolling in another direction. And the next thing I knew, I'd kind of pitched this idea to develop this course to my department head. And they were real worried about it at first. They were like, okay, we got to get the Dean's approval. And then maybe we, let's not put too much energy in developing this course because it might get shot down. Like Penn State has a drinking problem. So maybe we shouldn't have a class on drinking. Um, but it got approved, I think because of the way I pitched it, you know, that it's not just about, it's, I think they were worried it might be a, you know, like a, a booze cruise kind of a class, right? And, um, but there's a lot of level, you know, there's, I talk a lot about responsibility and stuff in class, especially toward the end. Anyway, it was approved and I don't know, here we are now, it's the largest anthropology course in the United States. So I, you know, I like to think it's just because Penn State students love anthropology so much. That's the way I think about it, so. Yeah, I have a lot of friends that have taken the class and enjoyed it a lot. That's nice to hear. Thanks. Moving now into travel, how many countries have you been to? Which were your favorites? And is there anywhere you still want to go? It's only like 12 or 13 countries. Um, of course, there's like Mexico and Canada. But I mean, look, you know, a few countries in Europe and South America as well. Quite a few in Central America. Um, but, you know, what's... I mean, my favorite, you know, place that I've been, there's kind of two or kind of three, but, it, you know, Ireland and Scotland, you know, we, we took students to, to Scotland on a study abroad um, twice. And, you know, there's a lot of familiarity because it's, it's precursor to American culture. I mean, like it's Western culture, and it's, but it's a little different and, you know, and it's, and the people are really friendly and nice and you, you have so many similarities. And so it's comfortable, you know, and it's, and for me, with the Moonshine Project, there's this connection to Scots Irish, and so there was a lot of interesting things for for me, and I would love to go back. But truly, my favorite, in the sense of something that kind of shakes me and like really made me uncomfortable and wanting to go back and wanting to learn more, was Mongolia, because that's the, I mean, it's almost the polar opposite of the way in which we view alcohol, consume alcohol, what it's made out of, like everything about it. And um, so that's the place I wanna, wanna really go back and spend, and spend more time. And to answer your other question about where would I like to go? So I have yet to, I have not gone anywhere in Africa and Ghana is really high on my list um, for several reasons. One is just a, a, a you know, I, I think that I want to, as an American, I want to go there, um, you know, aside from the alcohol aspect is, you know, there's an estimated, you know, 7 million humans that moved through the Elmina castle um, to, you know, to become slaves all over the new world. Uh, a lot of them here in the United States. And, you know, the reason this country is as strong as it is, is because they built it. And, uh, you know, there's just some kind of like level of, of uh, kind of, paying homage and tribute to, to, to what happened there. Um, definitely, you know, I personally have some guilt about all that stuff too. Um, but it's just something that I want to do. And also I, I've had, I have a friend that's um, from Ghana 
he speaks so highly of it and has told me a lot about it. And of course they have some great alcohol like Octopeche and um, that I would like to try that they make, like everybody makes some, a lot of people make it in their backyards. And so that's, that's a really long answer to, to all of that, but favorites in places I want to go and, and uh, that kind of thing. Completely virtual you're teaching. How does that change the way that you prepare for class and how does that change the way that you teach and approach the class? And what is that like for you? Because for me, I, obviously would love to be in your classroom and Thomas 100 listening to your lectures and stuff but I look forward every week to seeing the the video recordings that you make like it's very interesting class and I do enjoy it so how does that change your approach to teaching if at all I mean the, the lectures that I gave that I recorded down at Zeno's um which was really awesome that they you know allowed me to do that um I, I was trying to find a way to make it kind of interesting you know, like, like a TV show kind of thing. And I, and I knew that it wouldn't be a TV show thing. It was just like, I teach another class where I'm doing this, right? I'm doing a Zoom lecture. I'm recording it on Zoom with slides and boring, right? I mean, like that's what every, every single one of you, you know, all the students are dealing with something very similar. And I'm, and I'm doing it too with one of my classes, but I luckily had the resources um, because the class is so large to say, hey, can I do this thing at Xenos? Can I like make it with a couple of different cameras? And can we like make it a little better um, and put a, little, a lot of work on the front end? And that was the difference. Like there was, like I shot all of those in like seven days, you know, like I did all, and it was a, it was so much work to do it like that, right? Um, but what's changed, you know, it seems like you'd think I'd have more free time or something, right? Because like, I'm not like preparing to teach. I mean, there's a lot of emails and stuff and like dealing with the TAs and they're great and all that, but there's, there's things to deal with. Um, but, but I'm also like homeschooling our daughter with, I'm doing it with my wife. Like we're, you know, like everybody's life's upside down right now. And so, um, but to deal with 140 with, with anthropology of alcohol, I can't, I, I can't tell you how much I miss it because I love being in there with that giant crowd and seeing reactions from things that I say that might be shocking or funny or just brand new, you know, and also seeing what works and what doesn't. I mean, you know, as a, as a, as a public speaker, what's working, because if you're going on and everybody's going, just staring then you're like oh i'm not getting through like this isn't working and you see heads shaking you know and you're like oh i'm getting through well when i do those lectures at xenos i don't know if what i'm saying is working or not and i miss even though in 100 thomas you 725 seats you don't have very many students that are bold enough to just be raise their hand and say hey i got a question but you do you know i ask for questions i walk around some and try to get interaction but students come down at the end. You know, I always, it's, a, it's an hour and 15 minute class. I always try to end it at about an hour. So there's like this 10 to 15 minutes and you out 10, 15 students will come down and man, they're telling me stuff that I didn't know. They're like, oh, you know, my dad grew up in upstate New York in a winery and they used to do this. And I'm like, I've never even heard of that before. So I'm actually learning stuff. I'm not learning anything from the students in, during COVID. You know, and, and in a way, unfortunately, you guys are learning less because you're not getting to ask questions, getting clarifications on certain things. But, you know, there's real, I don't think there's anyone to blame on it. You know, there's just, it's just the way it is right now and it's going to be over. Um, but there's going to be this kind of, this little bump that has occurred over this year and a half um, in, for schooling from, you know, from first graders to all through college, you know, um, so that's the way it's really changed and, and how much I miss it. Um, you know, I miss this, I just miss the interaction. Yeah, it's interesting to hear from a professor's perspective because I mean, Sam and I know it's hard to, for a student to learn virtually, but it's also hard for a professor to teach virtually. Um, switching, switching gears a little bit. Um, you have a Penn State love story that we've written about on our site before. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What was the title of that article? It was like cupcakes and Forest fires it's or something crazy? It from chocolate cupcakes and a forest fire to forever. A professorial Penn State love story. Wow. That's a mouthful. But the cupcakes to forest fire is really funny. Um, well, Because that's what happened. That was a really good title. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I came up to grad school here in 2003, and my now wife, Laurel, she started grad school here in 2005. And, um, you know, we had a tight group of people, uh, grad students in our anthropology department that hung out all the time. Um, like, we, we were usually down at the bars or whatever, like about eight or nine days a week um, in the afternoons. And so, um, but we did go down there uh, quite a bit, um, especially Thursday through like, Thursday through Saturday and and when she came in we already had this kind of tight group and she just fit right into the equation and we back then we hung out at the first a lot and you know I don't know she's cute and like funny and I don't know and then we kind of hit it off and then but see before that she'd come out to this forest fire thing brought cupcakes for my birthday and it was I'm not gonna get into the whole story but she brought cupcakes to my 30th birthday party and what was weird about it and the reason it stood out was that everyone that knew me like all my friends she had been invited by a friend of ours like hey Laurel you should come out to this guy Kirk's house he's having a 30th birthday party so everybody who knows me they bring either hot sauce or tequila because they know that that's that's what I want so it's just like just jars and jars of hot sauce and like different types of tequilas she brings cupcakes and I'm like what what do you Oh, that's cute. That's so cute. Like you brought cupcakes. Like she looks around, there's just tequila and hot sauce everywhere. And she's just holding these chocolate cupcakes. We had the same taste in music because it was playing on this. It was playing at the time and a band that nobody had heard of. And she was like, oh, you got Uncle Tupelo on. I was like, damn, how do you know that? And that was it, you know, just kind of started from there. And um, now we both teach in the anthropology department and have a daughter. So yeah, I, crazy. It's like David Byrne kind of thing you know um it's kind of crazy do you enjoy living in state college i'm from state college so oh you're a townie i oh. prefer to say local i'm a local i like i understand local but i'm a know, townie yeah i do have lots of friends that are townies and uh because i've been here so long that i had known i get i've gotten to know them um yeah you know i can't believe that i say yeah to that if you would have asked me 10 years ago i had been like no way but i tell you and another thing people tell you like, oh, when you have kids or something, it's your life's different. And I was like, my life's not going to, what are you talking about? Well, it does. It changes things. It's crazy safe here. It's like, you know, there's no traffic really. I mean, like it's, I mean, there are a lot of jobs I applied for in places that I wish that I wish I would have gotten the job at the time, different universities. I was like, oh my God, we could be living in Arlington, Texas, you know, where like people get shot all the time poverty rates through the roof and like you know they have metal detectors to go into their library to their university library I mean like you know what I mean like that trade-off wouldn't have been good you know I, I'm it's nice being here so yeah I do I do I do like it and I've made a lot of really great friends um you know over the over the geez almost 20 years 18 years I can't I can't even believe that both of you will say something like that one day. You're going to say, you're going to realize you've been doing something for 18 years and you're going to go, that's nuts. Anyway, it's nuts. As a professor of the anthropology of alcohol, how would you say the relationship between Penn State and alcohol is? I'll tell you what, it's, it's changed a lot. Um, I would say that from 2003 to now, it is very different. Um, I know it's going to sound weird, but there is a lot, there are less drinking problems now than there were then. Right. I mean, like it's still a crazy, it's still crazy. There's a, you know, Penn Staters drink like crazy and like crazy parties and all that, but that's the case at almost all universities, at all universities. I'm not gonna say most, all universities. Okay. Maybe not like Southern Baptist college in Texas. Okay. They don't have drinking problems they have other problems um but it's um you know a lot of the stuff that's happened you know 2009 that's when that's the last time penn state was number one party school and um and actually if you haven't listened to it you should listen to this american life um the npr the npr show in this american life um they, they did a story in 2009 called the number one party school. 
It is fantastic, man. Um, it really is. The whole thing is about Penn State, and it's awesome. Um, we haven't made that list. I think we made the top five a couple of years later, but not even the top 20 now. Um, granted, that, the way in which that, you know, the way in which they judge that um, based, you know, it's, it's, it's not like true science or anything like that. It's not a great sample size that they use. But still, it's a decent, a decent uh, marker. And just overall, I would say that the level of responsible drinking has increased and, and irresponsible drinking has decreased. Not a whole lot, but it's definitely different. Um, but there's still, the, to continue with this, you know, one of the things that's happened that's negative is that, um, you know, because of a lot of the, you know, sanctions and stuff that have happened, it's pushed drinking into into the corners, right? Into the instead of being able to drink in the common areas, you're drinking in your room, you know. Instead of you know, like like at, at fraternity houses, for instance, the common areas, a lot of them you can't drink, so so they just go to their bedrooms and drink. Well, what should happen is, I mean, to, drinking age should be eighteen is what should happen, and because if people are drinking in bars. There are people there. I know people don't think that bartenders and bouncers really care about you. They kind of do because they care about their business and they care about their jobs and they don't want you to get hurt. They don't want you to get assaulted. They don't want a fight to break out. They don't want those things to happen. They try to mitigate those problems. That does not happen at a private party. Um, you know, if somebody's mixing, you know, pills with uh, or, or any sort of drugs with alcohol, if you're doing that at a bar and you get caught doing it, you're out. You get caught doing it at a party, everybody's like, can I have some? It's a completely different thing, right? And, and so in other words, when you start pushing, drinking's dangerous. You take dangerous behavior and you push it further and further into the corners where there's no oversight, it's dangerous. And then now it's drinking only in rooms. You know, I mean, like it's it's not, it's not smart. Um, it's not a smart uh, approach uh, to to drinking. Um, so that's a, again another long answer to your question. But I think that overall, Penn State has done better. Um, you know, for the most part, it still has a long way to go. Uh, but how are you? I mean, when you're all I know is that when I was 18, 19, 20, tw on up to 26 or seven, invincible. I mean, like, you know, I mean, what are you going to, you can't tell anybody anything. Nobody could tell me anything. Um, it's really hard to, you know, and that's part of this class that I teach. I, I, I'm not trying to preach. I'm not trying to do anything. I'm just trying to, I feel like the only way you can change people's minds is give them information. And, and, and give it to them in a way that is palatable and it doesn't seem like you're being preached at and you can make your own decisions. Um, and that that's it, you know? And that's kind of what I'm, I'm trying to do. Um, yeah, it might not ever come across that way, but that's kind of how I think about it. Um, the State College Police Department released its annual warning for the challenge that typically occurs between the weekend, between Thawn and spring break. So what was your first impression of State Patty's Day and how has that changed? I thought it was kind of a cool idea, you know, it was like, oh, they, you know, because the first one was just like, it was this blip. It was like, oh, this cool little thing they put together because the spring break and they wanted it, hey, whatever. Okay. And the next year was kind of crazy. And then we're like, I mean, I'm not going downtown, you know, that's going to be crazy. Well, then the third year it started getting insane, right? Because then you got friends from out of town coming and it just got out of hand. And a lot of it had to do with its popularity, but this goes with anything. There were a lot of like festivals I used to like to go to. I don't go to anymore because they're too popular. Like, I don't want to go to that. I don't want to deal with 10,000 people. I liked it when it was like 500 or a thousand. I don't want to deal with that. And it's the same thing with this. And it's just too big and too crazy. I don't know. My feelings of it are mixed because I think that there is a destructive nature to it. I think I don't think that all the people that do that are from out of town. There's a lot of people from town, town meaning Penn Staters is what I mean. And, and, and overall, there is a disconnect between 
the community of State College and the, the university, um, I think that a lot of undergrads don't view State College as like a real town. Like the whole thing is a university. Like it's, this is ours. We pay a lot of money to go here and Calder Way is mine. You know, I mean, like that kind of thing. And it's not, and there's people that live there. And that, you know, tell you what, that, that This American Life that I was talking about, it really nails it with this. Like there are people that live here and raise kids on these streets right there. And it's just, there's a real disconnect because most of these undergrads that do this, they wouldn't do it on the street they grew up on in Jersey or in Scranton or wherever, right? They wouldn't do that. It just, that's my house. You don't tear that stuff up. That's my street, you know? And so there's some, there's a disconnect with that. Um, but I mean, with, you know, I think that State Patty's Day has been kind of, it's been kind of trailing off um, with its popularity, especially for out-of-towners and things like that. But it's still a problem. And I think the main problem is is not just the drinking, but the de but the destructive nature of it, of all the stuff that gets torn up, you know, and has to be replaced and that kind of thing. We're in kind of a interesting situation because everyone knows State Patty's Day is still going to happen, even though there's no spring break. But now we have to deal with COVID, this pandemic that's been going on since almost last year's State Patty's Day. So what do you think that we can expect this year? And how should Penn State deal with that? I don't know what I, ex I expect it to be way less impactful, meaning you know, a lot less people participating. Yes, it will still be a big deal. There's no way to stop it. Um, you know, I mean, I think some of the things that I kind of, I kind of want to say about this is that, again, to get back on this idea of, of, of me being 19 and 20 and 21, the social distancing and the face mask stuff, I, I honestly don't know what I would have thought. I, I had a big mistrust of government and authority of any kind then. And I probably would have just been like, you know, it's only old people that get it anyway. And, it, and it, I mean, like, there's so much misinformation now too. It's so serious. I mean, more people have died than of all the World War I, II, and Vietnam. Um, and that's just in a year. And I mean, it's, it's such a serious thing. I would hope that people try to keep it as small as possible with gatherings, not just for the safety aspect. It, okay, if you don't care about the safety aspect and you wanna get super selfish, then think about it this way. Okay, the Penn State Police Department is hiring, uh, is bringing in tons and tons of new of cops that are gonna be in plain clothes. Apartment complexes and property managers are hiring extra um, uh, people to do patrols, to look for gatherings and to look for underage drinking and to look for all sorts of stuff. Um, there is you know, property management, residence halls, all of these, they're bringing in extra people, not just because of the drinking, but because of COVID, right? And but because of COVID, if they're not masked and, they're, and they have too many people in a gathering, which is easy to do, what is it, 10 or something in a closed, I don't even know what the number is. 10, I mean, like, how can you not have more than 10 people? I mean, like, that's crazy. That's so small. Keep it small, right? Because if you don't, so I'm getting at this super, talking to the super selfish. If you get caught, you are going to be turned over and charged. I mean, you've charged on or off campus. You're going to be turned over and referred to the Office of Student Conduct. Is it really worth it just for a couple of days? I mean, for one holiday that's not a real holiday, um, just don't get yourself in trouble, right? And, and then for those who go ahead and do it, and even if you do it in small groups, right? And you drink like it's the last day on earth, and you do drugs like it's the last day on earth. I want everyone to just remember something that maybe too many people don't talk about because it's really hard to remember this kind of stuff when you're drunk, is that there is a, a Pennsylvania medical amnesty law and that if, you, if you're 18 years old and you are completely blottoed and your friend is passed out and is puking or you think you're worried about them or somebody else is worried, call 911, call the, you're not gonna get in trouble. It doesn't matter that you're drunk and you're underage. It doesn't matter because you're calling to help somebody. Don't, 
don't not call because you think you're going to get in trouble. You won't get in trouble. And I don't, I don't think that that's clear enough to a lot of people. They just think like, oh, shit, we're not calling. We can't call because we'll get in trouble. We have you know stuff in the house or whatever. Call. And so that's the thing I really wanted to say about this, because there is no stopping State Patty's Day. Um, and like I was talking about earlier of pushing this thing down into the corners more, this is going to push it even further into the corner. People are going to be going way out of their way to make sure they don't get caught. And, you know, I think that that's going to cause even another level of binge drinking because you only have a few hours or whatever to do this and you're going to try to get in as much fun as you can. Um, so just keep some of that stuff in mind about getting in trouble, um, you know, getting people, getting people hurt. Um, you know, I love to drink and I, people told me I shouldn't say that so much, but I really do. But just, and sometimes, sometimes I'm not super smart about it. Try to be better than me. Try to be smart when you're drinking. I'm not saying don't get drunk. I'm just saying like, rein it in just a notch, you know, and try to do that, especially with COVID. Um, the light is at the end of the tunnel right now, right? Let's not, let's not bring another, let's not have this thing go back up the other direction. What's next for you? I mean, obviously you still got your class and stuff, but what are you working on and what are you looking forward to doing? So, yeah, I've really moved away from, you know, I haven't done any real alcohol research. I have to I have this thing that I'm going to be doing with a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, um, uh, Neil Hutchinson, and with look interviewing some moonshiners all through Appalachia. Uh, that's not for like another six or eight months. But really, what I've been doing a lot of is, is um, a filmmaking. So I just finished documentary film. It's coming out on PBS uh, in April, and. Um, so it just came out, I just got the DVDs on Monday. I'm like, like somebody said, what's a DVD? Well, libraries and stuff still buy them. So, you know, they had to get a few DVDs. Um, but anyway, it's going to be on PBS. Um, and we finished that one. And we're currently making another one up in the Arctic. Um, we have some of the in, our, our Inuit colleagues, since we can't go up there right now, they've been doing a lot of the filming um, for us and or for them, I should say. Um, and so as soon as we can, as soon as travel restrictions are lifted, we'll be going up to, um, uh, it's a small village of Inukjiak on the east coast of Hudson Bay. Um, and what we're actually doing is, um, have you ever, either one of you ever heard of a, of a film called Nanook of the North? No. So it's the first documentary ever made. It was made in 1920, it came out in 1922. And it's, it started the whole thing. I mean, it started the genre of the documentary. Um, so we're remaking that film up in that same village where it was made and, um, and making it at the 100th anniversary. They started filming it in 1920. We started filming it in 2020. Um, and so that's what we're doing. We're trying to see from climate change and cultural changes, what, have, what has gone on in that area over the last 100 years, using that film kind of as a, as a marker to say what, show what it was like then and, and, and what it's like today. So really filmmaking is something that I'm you know, more into anthropological, you know, based kind of filmmaking, but, but that's where I'm, that's where my passion's really at right now. Do you have any non-alcohol related advice for college students? Yes, non-alcohol related advice. Yeah, a couple of things, but one of them is, I was just talking to a student the other day, uh, an undergrad student in my office hours. She's very concerned about, you know, trying to find what it is she wants to do right? Like, that's a big question, right? And it's something that, you know, no doubt the two of you have struggled with at some point, like, is it, what do I really want to do? Like, what do I want to do? You know, you want, you're spending so much money to go to school, and you want to make sure you pick the right thing. And like, worrying about trying to find the right thing is, is important. But what sometimes you don't think about it this way, but Finding the things you don't want to do is equally as important. And, the, and one way you find out about the things you don't want to do is to volunteer with a lab, volunteer with a professor, ask to be a TA in a class, get involved in something that you 
think you might want to do. In other words, be around some of those people, be around some of those grad students, be around some of those professors, listen to their conversations in a lab while you're working and you do this for one semester or for a couple of months, you might realize within three weeks, I want nothing to do with this. Like this, I, this is not my thing. I thought it was, but it's not. And you've just eliminated one of those things that you thought you might want to do. And it's a different way of thinking about it, like trying to find that thing that you want to do, just start going after it. And so really my advice is, this university is so enormous and there is someone that does everything that you can imagine at this university. Every type of research that exists, there's someone here that does it. Reach out and try and meet with them, volunteer with them, get some experience in some way. Um, it can really, I mean, and maybe, maybe all of a sudden it fits like, damn, this worked. I like this. I want to keep doing this. Or maybe not. And at the very least, it looks good on your resume that you, that you worked in a lab or you did some work like that, um, even for a short period of time. You know? So um, that's some advice I would give about just kind of getting. This university has so many opportunities that most people don't take advantage of. And make it work for you, right? I mean, like. You can't wait around and wait for the university to say like, hey, we have this opportunity for you. You should go do this. Find it, you know. Um, email professors. Don't worry about bugging them. We're, get, we're paid to, you know, to help, to teach. So, so reach out. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kirk, for joining us. Uh, it's been a really fun conversation. Um, I'm looking forward to your documentary coming out. I'm a documentary film student, so oh, I'm yeah. really looking forward to that. Well, then you got to go watch Nanook of the North then if you're done. I know. When you said that, I was like, damn, I should have known that. <laughs> it's so weird to watch, though. We've come a long way with documentary filmmaking. I'll tell you that. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Kirk French, thank you very much. Hey, thanks a lot for having me. Everybody, drink smart, drink safe. Take care. That was our episode with Dr. Kirk French talking about his class at Penn State and his story. Um, his love story, a little bit about St. Patty's Day. So what do you think, Sam? Pretty interesting conversation. You know, he had some good advice there at the end for uh, students that are interested in partaking in uh, alcoholic beverages and green shirts this weekend. I talked about this on an episode last year. My, uh, Me and my mom were at Jimmy John's one day on St. Patty's Day, and there was this kid that was just like, I was maybe 12, and this kid that was like passed out in his sandwich. He like had his, his salami <laughs> Sam and he was sitting there and just passed out. He was like hammered wearing his green shirt. And I was like, mom, what's going on? She like was like, oh, do you need a ride home or whatever? <laughs> but yeah, it was kind of interesting. But it's it's been it's been fun going from that to participating in it. So uh, what about you? What's your uh, first experiences with State Patties? Yeah, I think someone had to explain it to me. I didn't really do much last year, so I don't really have much of an experience with it. But all right. Well, Grace, that was fun. Appreciate you hopping on with me, just me this time. So, um, yeah, it's another episode of Podward State. My name is Sam Brungo. I'm Grace Cunningham. Take it easy, guys. Be safe this weekend. Yo le estoy diciendo, a rato no va a haber agua y vamos a sufrir. 
Y aunque tenga uno el dinero del mundo, no se lo van a vender. Pues no la hay. A ver, ¿con qué la vas a comprar, hijito? Cómprala. ¿De qué sirve tu dinero? Si no hay agua. Así que, ¿por qué? The film is huge, right? Because it represents a time and place that will never come back. Antes había era otra vida, otro mundo, otro otra cosa muy bonita. Antes no había tanta gente aquí, tantas casas. Ahora ya hay mucha casa. Well, I regard Land and Water as an anthropological classic. Bill Sanders was from a poor working class family. He served in World War II, used that GI Bill when he got back to go to Harvard. He ended up getting his PhD, later becomes a professor at Penn State in the anthropology department, and then had a decorated career where he becomes the distinguished Evan Pugh professor, was elected the National Academy of Sciences. The guy really had a major impact on the field of anthropology and archaeology. Bill was always avidly interested in anything that interested him. He didn't go halfway on anything. Anybody could have gone around and did it, but he did it, right? You know, what do we do in archaeology, anthropology? Uh, in the end, hopefully, we actually help people. Encuentro imágenes de uno de de mis antepasados, que es el señor Aniceto Martínez, eh, que es mi bisabuelo. Yo no tuve la, el gusto de conocerlo porque él, él murió en 1981. Desafortunadamente, tampoco lo conocía porque no tenemos fotografías de él. Hasta ahora que vengo a ver el documental. How many places in the world have footage of a particular community with detailed notes to go along with it so we can come back and revisit these same locations to document the changes. So that we're essentially we're measuring the changes through film. Ha cambiado la vida. Ahí en ese bordo que pasa ahí, pasaba un río de agua. Ahí iban a lavar las señoras y nosotros íbamos a nadar. A hoy no hay nada, no hay nada. Todo se acabó. Todo, ahora hay que cuidar el agua. <risa> <risa>